Good morning. Welcome to our morning worship and prayer. We are so glad you could join us today. And as we start our time, we're going to start with worship. I know many of you have been doing this for quite some time now, and we're grateful. Those of you, some of you, maybe this link was just brought to you or sent to you. I want to encourage you. Uh, the first part is not just uh, parang front act. It is a time for us to connect with God and to meet Him this morning. And so let's worship God together. We worship you.
Once again, welcome to our morning worship and prayer. We are currently going through the book of Psalms, but this time, as we go through it, we're focusing on the theme of abide, right? And so the Psalms, when you think about it, it's a collection of lyrical poems. Uh, one of the only two Old Testament books to identify as the composite work of, of multiple authors. Proverbs is actually one of those. David wrote many uh, and uh, but the others that wrote the Psalms were Asaph, the descendants of Korah, Solomon a little bit, Ethan, Haman of uh, the Ezra Heights. And these uh, psalmists would express their emotion of uh, their emotions, whether that's uh, joy or sadness, lament. Um, they're upset. Uh, they're upset with their enemies, sometimes even upset with God. And that's how beautiful the Psalms are, because you can be raw with your emotions with God, that you can actually pour out. And let me say this before we continue, that if you have something that is in your heart, number one, God already sees and knows what's in your heart. Number two, you can pour it out to God. God is never intimidated. I'll say that again. God is never intimidated by whatever's in our, in our hearts. He's God. He's Lord. He's sovereign. And so much of the psalmist would write about uh, worship, as I said, maybe lament also. But it shows the journey of the characters who have uh, written the psalms and how their relationship with God was like. We see how they struggled through their challenges and all that. We see also how they continued to uh, decided to continue to remain in the presence of God and to continue to walk with God in spite of the challenges that they went through, right? And that essentially is what it means to abide, to remain, to continue, to stay. Some of you, that's the calling of the Lord, stay. That's the calling of God in your life right now, or the challenge, remain. And some of you watching right now, maybe you're in a point of giving up. You're in a point of in the brink of letting go of your faith. It's not an accident that you're watching this right now. God is here speaking to you, even through a video, yes. He says, hold on, don't let go. Don't stop trusting Him. You see, when we look at the plant, the branch that abides remains connected no matter what. Strong winds, intense rain, severe heat. In Psalm 19, I'm going to look at the few verses, but in Psalm 19, we're, we're told here that it was written by David, declares the glory of God in the, in the first verses, right? Uh, the heavens declare the glory of God, uh, the, and the, the sky above proclaims His handiwork. That's what the psalmist was saying. And then from there, you'll notice it moves to the sufficiency of scriptures, that from the glory of God in the firmament, in the heavens, it zooms in to the Word of God, the tool and the manner by which you and I can remain, the manner by which we can stay. And listen, I know it's been said multiple times, but there is really no other truth other than if we remain in His Word, if we stay connected to the Scriptures, that's the fuel for the, the fire uh, in your walk with Jesus. And the Word of God is important uh, as we continue to abide. 
Why is it important? Number one, it revives our innermost being. In verse 7, we're told that the law of the Lord is perfect. Reviving the soul, right? That's what the scripture says. It, it is perfect. It is blameless. It is stable like a rock. And the word, the word that was used in Hebrew, perfect, means whole and complete. That's so beautiful. Whole and complete. It's not incomplete. It's not with flaw. It's not um, lacking in something. It is whole. It is complete. The Old Testament scholar, one test, Old Testament scholar says, it is all sided so as to completely cover all the aspects of a thing. That's how powerful and complete the Word of God is. It lacks nothing. It is all a person needs to live successfully in this world. It's, it's what we need every day. And Listen, the Word of God, it was written thousands of years ago, but it is still relevant and applicable to this day. The Word of God revives our innermost being, the Bible says. And to revive means to restore, to refresh, and even to transform, right? That's what the Word of God does. It restores. When you're, those of you who are watching today, you're worshiping with us today, and you feel broken up inside whether because of what's happened in the office, or maybe it's a relationship issue in the family. And it's like, uh, well, the Lord, of God, the Lord God can restore. He can restore your soul. He can refresh your soul, your soul and even transform the way you think, your perspective. God's Word restores our spirits when we're in despair, when we're down, when we face adversity. Um, Psalm 119 and 165 says, Great peace. Have they who love your law and nothing can make them stumble. Listen, when you have God's word in your life, when you hold on to God's word, it's like standing on the rock. You know, when there's, there's shaking, you want to be standing on something that is unshakable. I know there must be someone today watching this. And your situation is quite, it, it shakes you. And you know for a fact that apart from an outside force, you yourself cannot keep yourself secure and stable. Not only that, the Word of God also makes us wise. In verse 7 and verse 8, the law of the Lord is perfect. It revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. Look at the next one. Making wise the simple. Making wise. Why is the simple? How many of you who are worshiping with us today would say, you're, you're really just a simple person. You're not brilliant like, you know, like Albert Einstein or like, I don't know, if you can think of the most clever, most intellectual, intelligent person today. There was a guy, his name is Max Born, talking about Albert Einstein. Max Born was a close friend of Albert Einstein, a nuclear physicist and one of the greatest minds of the 20th century, right, was interviewed shortly before his death. Okay, this guy, Max Born, commented, I'd be happier if we had scientists with less brain and more wisdom. We are, without a doubt, the most educated generation. If you think about it, you can Google anything today. Everything's Googleable, right? You, you look at that search engine, you write and type a, a word, Thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of, of, of websites come up. But unfortunately, some of us lack wisdom. There is a difference. I always say this, you know, I, I talk to people, I said, you know, there's a difference between being smart and being wise. Right? You can know a lot of things, but being able to apply the knowledge to a specific situation, that's what it means to being wise. Now, in contrast to this lack of wisdom, the Word of God can make us wise. That's what we're given here. And some of you, you're believing God for insight. You are on a crossroad right now. You are in the middle of a major decision. Should I accept this job? Should I leave the country for, uh, for this career or this workplace? Or should I marry this person? Should we, have, should, should we have another child? Or should I move to this location, another house? God will give you wisdom. He will. If you lack wisdom, ask 
He will give generously, James chapter 1, verse 5, we're told. So we can continue to seek Him and ask Him for wisdom. See, the Bible is not something that changes. In our morally loose society, we have tried to reinterpret the Word of God to make it flexible. But God's Word never changes. It never changes. His wisdom remains through the decades. Um, and He never, he, he never uh, changes His mind. It's the same yesterday. He's the same yesterday, today, forever. And Scripture takes the one okay, uh, who does not know right from wrong and brings uh, to that individual the wisdom of God. The word is wise. And the word wise, okay, the word of God is wise. It gives wisdom. And the word wise in Hebrew language means to be skilled in the art of godly and practical living. Isn't that beautiful? To be skilled in the art of godly or practical living. It's really nice. That's what wisdom is. Because you and I today need insight and to be skilled. What it means to live for God and how to be able to give pleasure to Him. Like what Paul said, I, I, I desire nothing else but to bring Him glory. To be able to bring pleasure to Him. Third thing, it brings joy to our hearts. In verse 8, look at this. The precepts of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart. Rejoicing the heart. And the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. You know, the message version says, The life maps of God are right, showing the way to joy. Isn't that nice? It's showing the way to joy. What do people really want out of life? They want a sense of wholeness. A sense, of, a sense of contentment, a sense of belonging, right? And so many people do not enjoy life these days. They're always searching for something. They want to go out of town. They want to build their rest house somewhere. They want to have this kind of car. They want to be able to, you know, go to the beach and many different. And those are not wrong. But if they remain to be our only source of joy, it's insufficient. It really is. You will always be, we will always be searching for something that will bring peace and contentment. But as Peterson said in the message version, God's life map brings joy to life, right? And so that's essentially, and you know, that's what the scripture tells us, right? The joy of the Lord becomes our strength, right? And when we are in right relationship with God, the joy of the Lord will overflow upon us. And every single day, listen, that's going to be your strength. Because a cheerful heart is like good medicine. But a crushed spirit dries up the bones. And so when, when there's the joy of the Lord overflowing in our hearts, you wake up, there's spring on your legs, spring in your step. Like you get out of bed and it's like you can jump out of bed and say, I'm excited about today. Why does it bring us joy? It is because it tells us about God's great love and great redemption. It tells us about the Savior's love. It tells us that God will go to any length to restore us with a right relationship with Him. And finally, it gives us guidance. Verse 8, and I'll end with this one quickly. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The commandments of the Lord will give light to the darkened understanding. It'll give guidance. And some of you here today, it's, it seems like there's darkness that surrounds. And it seems like uh, you can't go very far because you can't see very far. David refers to the Word of God as commandments. The Bible is not full of suggestions, but they are authoritative commandments. Why? Because it is written by the lawgiver. Why? Because the lawgiver is also the creator. The one who sees the beginning to the end. And these truths are not negotiable, not approved or unapproved by popular vote. God tells clueless people what He expects of them. Men and women are the most intelligent of all God's creation, but sometimes, believe it or not, we still act foolishly, which is why we need God's Word. God's Word provides all we need to break this cycle. And, and you know, people who go climbing in the Alps, for the first time, are usually fashioned, are fastened rather by a rope, so uh, to their guide, so that they won't get lost. We need that. We need to be fastened.
to God by the Word of God so that when we go through the darkest of caves, if we go through the highest of highs and the lowest of lows, we can say, Your Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that, Lord, as we stay, as we remain, as we continue in, in our walk with you, we would have a sense that we are fastened to God by the word of God so that when we go through the highest of heights and the lowest of lows, we thank you that your word is there to guide, to bring joy, to revive our soul, to help us in time of our need. Thank you, Lord. And some of you here today, you're believing God for wisdom and you're in a crossroad. I want to pray for you right now. You're in a crossroad and whether to take this job, to move to this location, to, to, to apply for this visa for this country, to get married, to have more children, whatever that crossroad with me, let me pray. That might be, let me pray. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. You said, you're going to show it to us. Lord, if we lack wisdom, you'll give it generously without finding fault. And as we abide, Lord, as we stay and remain, we will see that you will bring revelation. Let there be revelation even now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. close us in prayer and let me share this with you. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, body be kept blameless at the, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. God bless you. Have a great day ahead.